Welcome to Monster Madness, where nightmares come to life. Here, in the shadowed corners of the world, monsters lurk, waiting for the moment you least expect. These are not just stories, they are whispers of what hides in the darkness, what claws at the edges of your sanity, and what waits beneath your bed. Remember, once you enter Monster Madness, there's no turning back. Hello, creatures of the night, and welcome back to another spine-tingling episode of Monster Madness, where the shadows come alive and the whispers of the unknown send shivers down your spine. Before we get too far into the video, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and click that subscribe button. All my rowdy friends and I have a nice video for you tonight, so go ahead and dim your lights, lock your doors, and prepare yourself for a tale that will haunt your dreams. I can still hear the scream if I think about it. The way it cut through the night, sharp and shrill, before dissolving into the silence of the mountains. It wasn't the kind of scream you forget. It wasn't the kind you could ignore. Even now, weeks later, it plays on a loop in the back of my mind, scratching at the edges of my sanity. I've been a search and rescue officer for the last 12 years, stationed out of Sheridan, Wyoming. The Bighorn Mountains are my backyard, vast, untamed, and beautiful in a way that makes you feel both small and insignificant. I've seen them in every season, their snow-capped peaks piercing through storm clouds, their green valleys swaying under summer breezes, and their deep woods cloaked in shadow. I know their trails, their dangers, and their secrets, or at least, I thought I did. When the call came in about a missing hiker near Devil's Spire, I didn't think twice about taking the assignment. Devil's Spire was rugged, sure, but not unmanageable. A few hunters had gotten turned around out there before, and I figured Henry Caldwell, our missing man, was no different. Maybe he'd wandered off the trail chasing a mule deer or twisted his ankle on the loose shale. Either way, I expected to find him cold and hungry, but alive. That's what I told myself, at least. But that summer, the mountains felt different. The air was too still, the skies too gray. Even before I set foot on the trail, there was a weight to the world that I couldn't explain, like the forest itself was holding its breath. I chalked it up to the weather or a bad night's sleep, but deep down I knew better. The old-timers in Sheridan used to tell stories about Devil's Spire, tales meant to scare kids away from the deeper woods. They spoke of strange carvings, hikers who vanished without a trace and lights that flickered between the trees on moonless nights. I never gave those stories much thought. Legends and ghost tales I'd always figured. But as I packed my gear that morning, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was heading into something I didn't understand. By the time Pete and I arrived at the trailhead, the sun was already dipping behind the ridges, and the air had turned cold. Pete was my partner for the night. A grizzled ranger with a no-nonsense attitude, and a knack for brushing off danger. He stood by the truck, double-checking his pack, his usual smirk tugging at the corner of his mouth. Missing hiker, huh? he said, adjusting the strap on his flashlight. Bet you twenty bucks he's holed up in a cave somewhere, sipping on a flask he didn't tell his wife about. I forced a chuckle, but my mind was elsewhere. The stories, the unease in the air, it was all pressing down on me but I couldn't bring myself to say anything. Pete didn't believe in that kind of stuff, and I wasn't about to give him a reason to rib me all night. Let's just find him, I said, hoisting my pack onto my shoulders. The sooner we start, the sooner we're out of here. Pete snorted, his boots crunching on the gravel as he turned toward the trailhead. Relax, you're wound up tighter than a snare drum. This is just another walk in the woods. I didn't respond. My eyes drifted to the line of trees ahead, their black silhouettes stark against the darkening sky. Somewhere out there, Henry Caldwell was waiting for us, or at least, that's what I hoped. What I didn't know then was that something else was waiting, too. The trail into Devil's Spire was narrow and winding, carved through dense pine and fir trees that seemed to press in on us from all sides. The forest felt alive, but not in the way I was used to. It wasn't the gentle rustle of leaves or the distant call of a hawk. It was something deeper, 
an oppressive stillness that seemed to vibrate just beneath the surface of the world. The kind of quiet that makes you second-guess every step, every breath. The air smelled damp, heavy with the scent of moss and decaying wood. Our boots crunched on the dirt, the sound far too loud in the suffocating silence. Every now and then, a branch creaked or a bird took flight, and I found myself flinching at the noise. Pete, on the other hand, marched ahead like nothing was out of the ordinary, his flashlight cutting sharp beams through the gloom. You're awful quiet tonight, he said over his shoulder, his tone light but probing. Just focused, I replied, scanning the shadows for movement. The truth was I didn't trust myself to speak. The unease had grown worse the deeper we ventured, and I didn't want to give it a voice. Pete and I had worked together on and off for years. He was the kind of guy who never let the job get to him, a practical joker with a quick wit and an almost infuriating level of confidence. Where I was methodical, Pete was brash, tackling problems head-on without much thought for the consequences. It made us a good team most of the time, but tonight his bravado felt like a liability. I don't tell me those stories are getting to you, he said with a chuckle. The ones about this place. The carvings, the lights, the, what do they call it? The Watcher. Pete, shut up, I said, but my voice lacked conviction. He laughed again. Louder this time, the sound bouncing off the trees. Relax, man. If there's anything out here, it's more scared of us than we are of it. I wasn't so sure. The trail curved sharply around a cluster of boulders, and that's when we found it, Henry Caldwell's campsite, or what was left of it. The tent was shredded, its fabric hanging in tatters from the frame. Gear was scattered everywhere, a crushed water bottle, a ripped sleeping bag, a flashlight with a cracked lens. The ground was torn up, as if something heavy had been dragged across it, and the air was thick with the coppery tang of blood. Pete crouched near the remains of the tent, his usual smirk replaced by a grim frown. Bear attack, he muttered, more to himself than to me but I could see the doubt in his eyes. No bear did this, I said, stepping closer. My flashlight beam landed on something carved into one of the nearby trees. It was a symbol, about the size of my hand, etched deep into the bark. A jagged spiral surrounded by spidery lines that seemed to twist and writhe in the flashlight's glare. The sight of it made my stomach churn. What the hell is that? Pete asked, standing and brushing the dirt from his knees. I don't know, I admitted, running a gloved hand over the grooves. The wood felt warm to the touch, almost as if it were alive. Think it's his, Pete gestured toward the mess of the campsite. I shook my head. It doesn't look like something a hiker would do. And look, there are more. I pointed to another tree, and another beyond that, each marked with the same spiral pattern. They formed a rough circle around the campsite, enclosing it like a fence or a trap. Maybe it's some kind of boundary, Pete said, his voice quieter now. You know, like those rock piles people make to keep out spirits, or whatever. Then what's it keeping out, I asked. Or in, Pete said, his lips tightening into a thin line. For the first time that night, I saw something like fear in his eyes. As we stood there, the forest seemed to shift around us. The air grew colder, the silence deeper, and then I heard it, a low, guttural sound, somewhere between a growl and a moan. It came from the darkness beyond the circle of trees, too deep to be an animal and too alien to be human. Pete raised his flashlight, its beam trembling slightly as it swept across the shadows. Did you hear that? He whispered. Yeah, I said, my voice barely audible. The sound came again, closer this time. My heart thudded painfully in my chest, and I gripped my flashlight like a weapon, even though I knew it wouldn't do me any good. We need to move, Pete said, his usual confidence replaced by something raw and instinctual. Now. We turned back toward the trail, but before we could take a step, something crashed through the underbrush to our right. The growl rose into a piercing, bone-chilling screech that echoed through the trees, and I felt my blood run cold. The screech faded into the night, but the forest around us felt alive with tension. Every muscle in my body screamed at me to run, but my legs felt rooted to the ground. Pete, usually so unshakable, was rigid beside me, his flashlight beam darting erratically through the trees. 
Did you see it? I whispered, my voice barely more than a breath. See what? Pete snapped, his tone sharper than usual. I didn't see a damn thing, but I heard it. That wasn't a bear, and it sure as hell wasn't a mountain lion. The growl had come from just beyond the tree line, but there was no sign of movement now, no crunch of leaves, no snapping branches. Just that awful silence, so heavy it felt like a physical weight pressing down on us. Pete gestured toward the trail. Let's go. Whatever it is, we're not sticking around to meet it. We moved quickly, our boots crunching against the dirt and rocks as we left the destroyed campsite behind. The forest around us seemed darker, the shadows deeper, as if the trees were closing in. And then we found the tracks. They were massive, like an oversized human footprint, but wrong. The toes were elongated, clawed, and the heel was too narrow, almost pointed. They sank deep into the ground, far deeper than any human or animal could have managed. What the hell, Pete muttered, crouching beside one of the prints. He ran his fingers along the edge of the indent, his brow furrowing. These are fresh. Whatever made these, it's close. I told you, I said, my voice trembling. Something's out here. Something we don't understand. Pete stood, shaking his head. Don't start. We're not dealing with ghosts or monsters, all right? Maybe it's a rogue grizzly. Maybe it's, I don't know, some kind of prank. But I'm not losing my head over some tracks. Even as he spoke, his hand drifted to the knife on his belt. We pressed on, following the faint trail left by Henry Caldwell, or whatever had been chasing him. The deeper we went, the more signs of disturbance we found. Broken branches hung like jagged teeth from the trees. Gouges marred the trunks. The wood splintered and raw. Once, I caught sight of a patch of red on the ground, a smudge of dried blood, but Pete barely gave it a glance. The forest had changed. It wasn't just the sounds or the stillness. It was the way the trees seemed older, gnarled and twisted in unnatural ways. Their trunks were scarred with more of the spirals and jagged lines some so deep they looked like they'd been carved with claws. You ever see trees like this before? I asked, running my flashlight across one of the marks. No, Pete admitted. He tried to keep his tone casual, but I caught the edge of unease. Maybe some kind of fungus, or lightning damage. Lightning doesn't do this, I said, gesturing to the spirals. Pete didn't respond. Then the whisper started. At first, I thought it was the wind, but the sound was too rhythmic, too deliberate. Low murmurs drifted through the trees, rising and falling like distant voices speaking a language I couldn't understand. Do you hear that? I asked, stopping in my tracks. Pete froze beside me, his eyes darting to the shadows. It's the wind, he said, but his voice lacked its usual confidence. No, it's not, I said. It's, it's like people talking. Don't, Pete said sharply. Don't start hearing things, all right? That's how you lose your mind out here. But I could see it in his eyes. He heard it, too. The whispers grew louder as we continued. A chorus of unintelligible words that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. My skin crawled, and I found myself gripping my flashlight so tightly that my fingers ached. And then we found the clearing. It was a wide, open space surrounded by ancient trees whose twisted branches intertwined to form a canopy that blocked out the stars. In the center stood a stone altar, worn smooth by time, and covered in more of the strange symbols. Around it lay the remains of animals, deer, rabbits, even a black bear, all arranged in grotesque patterns, their bodies broken and twisted, as if by some unimaginable force. Pete let out a low whistle, his bravado slipping further. What the hell is this? I don't know, I said, my voice barely audible. We approached the altar cautiously, our footsteps disturbingly loud against the packed dirt. The air here was colder, sharp and metallic, and it carried a faint hum, like the vibration of an invisible wire. Pete knelt beside the altar, examining the symbols with a furrowed brow. These aren't random, he said. Someone put a lot of work into this. Who? I asked. And why? Before he could answer. The whispers rose into a deafening cacophony. I clapped my hands over my ears, but it didn't help. The voices weren't coming from outside. 
They were inside my head, drilling into my thoughts with their insistent, alien words. Pete staggered back from the altar, his face pale. We need to go, he said, his voice shaking. Now? But before we could move, the forest around us erupted with sound. Branches cracked, leaves rustled, and that same unearthly screech tore through the night, louder and closer than before. What horrors lie beyond the clearing? And can Pete and the narrator escape the encroaching darkness? Keep listening to find out what hunts them in the heart of Devil's Spire. Don't forget to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. Now back to the story. The screech tore through the clearing, a sound so raw and unnatural that it felt like the air itself was ripping apart. Pete and I froze, our flashlights trembling as they cast shaky beams into the oppressive dark. The forest around us erupted with movement, branches snapping, leaves rustling, something heavy pushing through the underbrush. It's coming, I whispered the words barely audible over the thunder of my pulse. Pete drew his knife, his knuckles white around the hilt. Stay close, he said, his voice low but steady. Whatever it is, we're not going down without a fight. But when it stepped into the clearing, every instinct I had screamed to run. The thing was tall, easily seven feet, and grotesquely thin, its limbs impossibly long and ending in clawed fingers that gleamed like obsidian. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, stretched tight over a skeletal frame that looked wrong, like it had been assembled by someone who didn't quite understand how bodies were supposed to work. Its head was a mockery of humanity, its face a featureless expanse except for two deep, empty sockets where eyes should have been. From its mouth, jagged and too wide, came a sound, a clicking, chittering noise that set my teeth on edge. Pete swore under his breath, but I couldn't move, couldn't speak. The thing tilted its head toward us, as if it were listening, and then it moved. It came at us with an unnatural speed, its limbs jerking and bending in ways that defied logic. Pete barely had time to react, slashing out with his knife as the thing lunged. The blade connected, slicing across its arm, but it didn't slow down. The creature lashed out, its claws raking across Pete's chest. He stumbled back with a cry, blood blooming across his shirt. Run, Pete shouted, his voice raw with pain. I hesitated, torn between helping him and fleeing, but the creature gave me no choice. It turned toward me, its empty sockets locking onto my flashlight. The beam seemed to irritate it, and it let out another ear-splitting screech before charging. I dove to the side, hitting the ground hard. The flashlight flew from my hand, its beam casting wild, spinning shadows across the clearing. In the chaos, I caught a glimpse of Pete, his face pale and twisted with pain as he clutched at his chest. Go, he shouted again, his voice hoarse. The creature turned back to him, its claws raised. Pete met its gaze, if you could call those empty pit's eyes, and surged forward, his knife slashing in a wide arc. Come on, you bastard, he yelled. For a moment it worked. The creature hesitated, its head tilting again as if studying him, but then it struck. Its claws slashed through Pete's shoulder, and he fell to his knees with a guttural cry. Before I could react, the creature grabbed him, its elongated fingers wrapping around his torso like a cage. Pete struggled, screaming and stabbing at its arms, but it didn't let go. And then, in one impossibly fast motion, it dragged him into the shadows. Pete. I screamed, scrambling to my feet. My flashlight lay several feet away, its beam flickering weakly, but I didn't dare take my eyes off the spot where Pete had disappeared. The forest fell silent again, the oppressive quiet broken only by the ragged sound of my breathing. My chest heaved as I stood there, frozen, straining to hear anything. Footsteps, a cry for help, anything. But there was nothing. And then, the whispering started again. It came from all around me louder now, more insistent. The alien language drilled into my skull, making it hard to think, to move. My head throbbed with the effort of staying upright, of fighting the overwhelming urge to collapse and give in to whatever the voices wanted. But Pete's scream, sharp, sudden, and abruptly cut off, snapped me out of it. I grabbed my flashlight and bolted, my legs burning as I tore through the woods. The trail was gone, 
I didn't care. I just ran, the beam of my light bouncing wildly as branches whipped against my face and arms. Behind me, I heard the creature moving, its clicking and chittering growing louder with every step. It was toying with me, I realized. It could have caught me if it wanted to. I burst into a small ravine, my boots skidding on the loose rocks. My ankle twisted, and I went down hard, the flashlight flying from my hand again and shattering against a rock. The darkness closed in around me, thick and suffocating. I scrambled to my feet, my hands searching for anything I could use as a weapon. My fingers closed around a jagged branch, and I gripped it tightly, spinning toward the sound of the creature. But it didn't come. The whispering stopped, the forest going deathly silent once more. For a moment I thought I'd lost it. Then I saw it. Those empty sockets staring at me from the ridge above, its pale form silhouetted against the faint light of the moon. It didn't move. It just watched, its head tilting slowly, its claws flexing in deliberate, jerky motions. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it melted back into the shadows, leaving me alone in the ravine. I didn't wait to see if it would come back. I ran until my legs gave out, collapsing just as the first rays of dawn broke through the trees. The sunlight felt wrong as I stumbled out of the forest, like it didn't belong in the same world I had just crawled out of. My legs barely carried me to the edge of the tree line, and when I finally collapsed in the dirt, all I could do was stare at the golden glow breaking over the mountains. It should have been beautiful, but all I felt was hollow. They found me hours later, slumped against a boulder near the trailhead, my face bloodied and my clothes torn. Pete's name was the first thing I said when they asked what happened, but as I tried to explain, the words stuck in my throat. The official report lists Pete as missing, presumed deceased. The team that went back to Devil's Spire found the shredded remains of Henry Caldwell's campsite, but nothing else. No tracks, no altar, no blood. Not even the strange carvings we'd seen on the trees. They told me it was likely a bear attack, that the symbols were probably left by some bored hikers, but I knew better. I quit search and rescue two weeks later. I couldn't bring myself to go back into the mountains, not after what I'd seen. Not after Pete. My nights are filled with dreams of that thing, its long, pale limbs, its clicking, chittering voice, the way it dragged Pete into the shadows. I wake up gasping, convinced I can still hear him screaming. And then there's the other thing. When I close my eyes, I see the altar. I see the strange symbols carved into the trees and hear the whispers rising like a tide. But there's more now, images I can't explain, memories that don't belong to me. I see people, groups of them, gathered around that stone slab, their faces obscured by dark hoods. I see the creature, the watcher, I've started calling it, standing over them motionless and patient, as they chant in that same alien language I heard in the woods. I've tried to convince myself it's just my mind playing tricks, the trauma twisting my memories into nightmares. But last week, I found something in my closet, a small smooth stone etched with one of those spirals. I don't know how it got there. Sometimes, when the nights are too quiet, I think I can hear the clicking again. Faint, distant, but unmistakable. I keep the lights on now, though I'm not sure they'd help. If the Watcher wants me, it'll come. They say the Devil's Spire has claimed dozens of lives over the years that some people go into the forest and never come back. But what if they do? What if they come back like me, hollowed out and carrying something they don't understand? I can't bring myself to go back, but I know it's still out there, waiting. And I don't think it's finished with me yet. Welcome to Monster Madness, where nightmares come to life. Here, in the shadowed corners of the world, monsters lurk, waiting for the moment you least expect. These are not just stories, they are whispers of what hides in the darkness, what claws at the edges of your sanity, and what waits beneath your bed. Remember, once you enter Monster Madness, there's no turning back. Hello, creatures of the night, and welcome back to another spine-tingling episode of Monster Madness, where the shadows come alive and the whispers of the unknown send shivers down your spine. Before we get too far into the video, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and click that subscribe button. 
All my rowdy friends and I have a nice video for you tonight. So go ahead and dim your lights, lock your doors, and prepare yourself for a tale that will haunt your dreams. I can still hear the screams if I let myself remember. Not just the screams of men. Those were bad enough, but the others. The ones that came from the forest itself. Low and hollow, like the earth itself was crying out. I try to tell myself it was just the wind twisting through the frozen trees. But I know better. I've known better since that night. My name is Lieutenant Ethan Cole. I've spent over a decade as a Navy SEAL, serving in the worst places on this planet. Deserts where the air could kill you faster than a bullet, jungles so thick with death you could feel it in your lungs. I've seen what men can do to each other in war, and I've seen what nature can do to anyone foolish enough to challenge her. None of it prepared me for Alaska. We were sent up there on what they called a recon and recovery mission. Simple enough, a remote research outpost in the middle of nowhere had gone dark. No transmissions, no check-ins, just radio silence. It wasn't uncommon in places like that. Harsh conditions could knock out equipment, and isolation did strange things to people. Our orders were to head in, assess the situation, and bring anyone we found back to safety. Straightforward, right? But from the moment we landed, something felt wrong. It wasn't anything obvious at first. Just small things. The way the forest felt too still, too quiet, like it was holding its breath. The snow muffled everything even our footsteps. But sometimes I thought I heard something, something just at the edge of hearing, a crackle, a whisper, like someone calling my name from far away. I told myself it was just the wind or the creak of ice shifting in the cold. I had to tell myself that. Alaska wasn't unfamiliar to me. I'd done cold weather survival training here early in my career. Back then, it had felt wild, untamed, but not hostile. This time, it felt different. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were trespassing somewhere we weren't meant to be, and whatever was out there, it knew. Keep your head in the game, Cole, Commander Harris had said as we trekked through the snow. It's just another mission. Just another mission. That's what I told myself as we approached the outpost. But deep down I knew better. By the time we reached that godforsaken place, the unease in my gut had turned into a knot of dread I couldn't ignore. The outpost loomed ahead of us, a dark shape barely visible through the wall of swirling snow. The place looked abandoned, lifeless. Its metal fencing sagged, twisted like something heavy had leaned against it. The research station itself, a cluster of prefabricated buildings, was covered in frost, the windows black and unwelcoming. The entire scene reeked of desolation, like we'd stumbled upon the skeleton of something long dead. The forest pressed in around us, the trees ancient and gnarled. Their blackened branches clawed at the pale gray sky. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the crunch of our boots in the snow and the occasional gust of wind that seemed almost too warm for the biting cold. The snow smelled metallic, sharp and clean, but underneath it was another scent, faint, sour and wrong, like something rotting just beneath the surface. Chief Petty Officer Ramirez was the first to speak. Well, this is cozy, he muttered, his voice carrying a faint edge of sarcasm. Ramirez had been with me on more missions than I could count. We'd seen each other through firefights, narrow escapes, and nights spent patching each other up in the field. His dry humor was a shield, a way of keeping the worst of it at bay. Cozy enough for you, Chief, I replied, trying to match his tone. But I could tell from the way his eyes scanned the tree line that he felt it too. The unease. The wrongness. Corbin Davis... The youngest of us wasn't as good at hiding his nerves. This place gives me the creeps, he said, his breath visible in the icy air. He gripped his rifle like a lifeline, his fingers trembling slightly despite the gloves. Doesn't feel right. Nothing out here feels right, Ramirez shot back. It's Alaska, kid. Nature doesn't play fair up here. Commander Harris cut off the banter. Focus. We clear the station first. Questions later. As we approached the first building, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. I glanced back at the forest and caught a flicker of movement, a dark blur darting between the trees. I froze, my hand tightening on my weapon. 
See something? Ramirez asked, his voice low. Probably nothing, I lied. The inside of the station was worse than the outside. The air was stale, heavy with the coppery tang of blood and something else. Something chemical, like burnt plastic. The walls were covered in frost, and our flashlights reflected off the frozen surfaces, creating a kaleidoscope of shifting shadows. It didn't help that the generator was dead, leaving us in near silence except for the faint hum of static from our radios. Then we found the first sign of what had happened, blood, a lot of it. It started in the main hallway, long streaks smeared across the floor and leading deeper into the station. Ramirez knelt to examine it, his face grim. No bodies, he muttered. That's not good. Maybe they got out, Davis offered weakly. Maybe, Ramirez said, but his tone made it clear he didn't believe it. The trail led us to the common room, where a half-collapsed table lay on its side. More blood splattered the walls, and something had clawed deep gouges into the wooden doorframe, deep enough that it made my stomach twist to think of what kind of force could have done that. And then there was the noise. A low, guttural sound, halfway between a growl and a moan, drifted in from outside. It was faint, almost drowned out by the wind, but it was there. All of us froze, instinctively raising our weapons. What the hell was that? Davis whispered, his voice barely audible. Ramirez shook his head. Not a bear, he said. That's for damn sure. We exchanged glances, and for the first time, I saw genuine fear in Harris's eyes. He opened his mouth to say something, but before he could, the sound came again, closer this time. And louder. Something was out there, something big. The noise outside faded leaving us in an even heavier silence than before. My heart pounded in my ears as we huddled in the common room, our flashlights bouncing off the bloodied walls. Harris gestured for us to spread out and search for clues, his jaw clenched tight. No one wanted to move. Ramirez, check that side, Harris ordered. Cole, you and Davis take the hall. Ramirez hesitated, his usual bravado muted. You got it, sir, he said, his voice low. He shot me a look, just a flicker but enough to tell me he was on edge. Davis and I moved down the hall together, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the dark. Every step felt wrong, the air thick and cold in a way that settled into my chest. The smell of burnt plastic grew stronger, almost choking. Davis muttered under his breath, his words spilling out in a nervous stream. This is bad. This is really bad. People don't just disappear like this. And those claw marks... That's not an animal, man. That's not. Quiet, I snapped, more harshly than I intended. I didn't want to hear it. Didn't want to think about it. We stopped outside a room labeled Laboratory 3. The door was slightly ajar, creaking softly in the draft. I pushed it open with the muzzle of my rifle, my flashlight sweeping the room. What we found made my stomach turn. The lab was trashed, equipment overturned and shattered but it wasn't the chaos that made me freeze. It was the symbols. They were carved into every surface, tables, walls, even the ceiling. Strange, looping designs that seemed to twist and writhe in the light. They glowed faintly, pulsating with a sickly green hue. What the hell is this? Davis whispered, his voice trembling. I stepped closer to one of the carvings, trying to make sense of it. The lines weren't just carved, they were deep, gouged into the metal like the tool that made them was impossibly sharp. I reached out, stopping just short of touching the symbol. The air around it felt hot, almost buzzing, and my vision blurred slightly as I stared. Cole, Davis hissed. Let's go. I don't like this. Before I could answer, the room grew colder. The glow of the symbols dimmed, and the air felt heavy, pressing down on us like we were underwater. Then we heard it. A voice, low and guttural, speaking words I couldn't understand. It wasn't coming from the hall or the room. It was everywhere, filling the space around us. Davis panicked. Nope, nope, we're leaving, right now. Wait, I said, gripping his arm. We need to. But he was already backing away, his flashlight shaking in his hands. I'm not dying in here, man. I'm not. His words cut off with a sharp gasp as his light hit something in the corner. 
At first I thought it was a person. It crouched low, its limbs long and angular, its head tilted at an unnatural angle. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, stretched tight over sharp bones. It didn't move. It didn't breathe. It just stared. Its eyes were empty pits, black and bottomless. Run, I whispered, barely able to get the word out. Davis didn't need to be told twice. He bolted, his footsteps echoing down the hall. I wanted to follow, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from the thing in the corner. For a moment, I thought it was just another shadow, a trick of the light. Then it moved. Its head twitched first, snapping toward me with an audible crack. Then its body followed, unfolding itself like a spider. I stumbled back, my flashlight flickering. The thing let out a sound, a low, chittering growl that vibrated through my chest. I ran. When I caught up with Davis in the hallway, he was hyperventilating, his back pressed against the wall. What the hell was that? He choked out. I don't know, I said, gripping my rifle so hard my knuckles ached. But we're not staying to find out. Back in the common room, Ramirez was waiting, his face pale. Something's out there, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I saw it through the window. Big, fast, it's circling the station. Harris glared at him. Get it together, Chief. We're trained for this. Trained for what, exactly? Ramirez shot back, his composure cracking. Because I don't remember any of this in the manual. The tension between them was palpable, but I didn't care. All I could think about was the thing in the lab, the way it moved, the way it looked at me. We need to leave, I said. Now. Harris shook his head. Not until we figure out what happened here. Are you kidding me? Davis snapped. What happened is obvious. Something killed them. Something's hunting us. We stay here, we die. No one's dying, Harris growled. Not on my watch. But his bravado rang hollow. Deep down, we all knew the truth. Whatever was out there wasn't going to let us leave. The scratching came first. It started faint, a soft skittering sound at the edge of hearing. Then it grew louder, a scraping of claws on metal that echoed through the outpost like a warning. We were back in the common room, huddled near the overturned table, weapons drawn. The air was frigid, each breath a cloud of white mist. Windows now, Harris barked, motioning for Ramirez and me to cover the corners. I swung my flashlight toward the nearest window, the beam slicing through the frost-covered glass. At first there was nothing but the swirling snow. Then something moved. A shadow, large, impossibly fast, darted between the trees, just beyond the perimeter. Did you see that? Ramirez hissed. Stay focused, Harris snapped, but his voice wavered. The scratching turned into pounding. Heavy, deliberate thuds rattled the walls, coming from all sides at once. Davis whimpered, his back pressed against the table. His flashlight shook in his hand, the beam dancing erratically across the blood-stained walls. Make it stop, he whispered. Make it stop. And then it did. Silence fell, so sudden and absolute it felt like the entire world was holding its breath. I strained my ears, the pounding of my heart deafening in the stillness. Then the door blew open. It wasn't wind that tore it from its hinges, it was force. Raw, violent force. The door slammed against the wall, splintering into shards. Snow swirled in, glittering in the beam of our flashlights. And standing in the threshold was it. It was taller than I'd imagined, its head nearly brushing the top of the frame. Its body was grotesque, all angles and elongated limbs, its pale skin stretched impossibly thin. Ribs jutted out from its torso like cage bars, and its hands, if you could call them that, ended in talons that gleamed like polished bone. But it was the face that froze me in place. Its eyes were black pits, endless and hollow, and its mouth stretched into a gaping maw, too wide filled with teeth that seemed to shimmer like glass. It tilted its head toward us, moving with an insect-like twitch. Then it screamed. The sound wasn't human. It wasn't animal. It was a high-pitched, bone-rattling wail that filled the room, vibrating through my chest and making my teeth ache. Davis dropped his rifle, clapping his hands over his ears as he screamed back, a raw, primal sound of terror. Fire! Harris roared. 
The room exploded with gunfire. Bullets tore into the creature, each impact sending ripples across its unnatural flesh. It staggered back, but it didn't fall. Instead, it moved faster, a blur of pale flesh and clawed limbs. It lunged at Ramirez first, swatting him aside like a rag doll. He hit the wall with a sickening crunch and crumpled to the floor, unmoving. I turned my weapon on it, aiming for the center of mass. The creature shrieked again, the sound somehow louder, sharper, like it was burrowing into my skull. My vision blurred, my knees buckling as nausea washed over me. Get back, Harris shouted, stepping forward and unloading his entire clip into the thing's chest. For a moment it paused, its body jerking with each impact. Then it turned to him. Harris, move, I shouted, but it was too late. The creature was on him in an instant, its talons slicing through his chest like paper. Harris's scream was cut short as he crumpled to the ground, blood pooling around him in the snow-dusted room. The thing let out a guttural growl and turned its hollow eyes toward me. I froze, my breath hitching as the weight of its gaze pinned me in place. My mind screamed at me to run, but my legs wouldn't move. Behind me, Davis scrambled toward the hallway, his sobs echoing as he fled. The creature lunged. Instinct took over. I threw myself sideways, narrowly avoiding its claws. My shoulder slammed into the floor, pain lancing through me as my flashlight skittered away. I fumbled for my sidearm, my fingers clumsy with adrenaline. A flare. My hand closed around it, and I yanked it from my belt. The creature loomed over me, its maw opening wide, a sickly, sweet stench rolling off its breath. I struck the flare and jammed it upward, the brilliant red light exploding between us. The thing recoiled, shrieking as the light seared its flesh. I didn't wait to see what happened next. I scrambled to my feet, grabbing the nearest rifle and firing blindly as I backed toward the hallway. Davis, I shouted, but he was gone. The creature recovered quickly, its movements jerky and unnatural. It crawled after me on all fours, faster than it had any right to be. I stumbled into the hallway, slamming the door shut behind me. My hands fumbled for the lock, but I knew it wouldn't hold. From somewhere deeper in the station, I heard Davis scream. And then, silence. I don't remember how I made it out. I remember running, my feet crunching through the snow, lungs burning with every frozen breath. I remember the sound of it behind me that wet, slithering scrape of claws against ice. But after that, nothing, just flashes. The red glow of the flare, the stark white of the snow, and then the blinding light of the rescue chopper's spotlight cutting through the dark. When they found me, I was half buried in the snow, clutching a rifle with no ammo and shaking so hard I couldn't speak. It took them hours to get anything coherent out of me. Even now, I'm not sure what I told them. Not the truth. That's for damn sure. What was I supposed to say? That something impossible had slaughtered my team. That I saw it, felt it, smelled its breath as it almost tore me apart. They wouldn't have believed me. The official report blamed a rogue bear. They found enough tracks around the outpost to make it plausible. Davis, Ramirez, and Harris were listed as Kia. Their remains were covered in what little was left of the research station. But I know the truth. There wasn't enough left of them to recover. They didn't see what I saw. They didn't hear the screams. I was given two weeks to decompress before the debrief. They wanted answers about the mission, what went wrong, why the station went dark. I didn't have any to give. The symbols we found, the creature, the voices, none of it made it into the report. When I tried to bring it up, my CO gave me a look that told me to shut my mouth. Classified, they said. Above my pay grade. And that was the end of it. Except it wasn't. I can't sleep. Not without seeing its eyes. Those endless pits of darkness that seemed to swallow the world. Not without hearing the sound it made when it screamed. Or the way Ramirez's body hit the wall like a broken doll. When I do manage to drift off, I wake up drenched in sweat, my heart racing convinced it's still out there, watching, waiting. I haven't touched a rifle since that night. I haven't gone near the woods or anywhere cold. The sound of snow crunching underfoot makes my skin crawl, and every shadow feels too long, too dark. 
I tell myself it's just my imagination, but deep down I know better. Before we left the station, I found something in the snow. A small, round object, metal, carved with those same twisting, glowing symbols we saw in the lab. I didn't mean to take it, but somehow it ended up in my pocket. I tried to throw it away once, but it always turns up again, sitting on my nightstand like it's waiting for me to remember. I don't know what it is. I don't want to know. But sometimes when the room is quiet and the night stretches too long, I swear I can hear something faint, just on the edge of hearing, a low, guttural sound like a voice calling my name. I tell myself it's just the wind, just the house settling. But I know better. It's still out there, and someday it'll come back.